Give it up for Larry Gelwicks, the winningest coach of America. Good morning, Bonneville High School. Hey, a very, very good morning. Thank you for being here. Uh, Wyatt mentioned that I'm the, I guess, the real life coach the movie Forever Strong was based upon. Just out of curiosity, how many have seen the film? Oh, my word. There's two back there that need to repent. Um, I did coach the Highland rugby team for 36 years and retired from coaching in 2011. Uh, it's been a, I've been a volunteer coach, my, as mentioned, my career in the airline and travel industry. Just as we get going, uh, maybe one or two of you have a question about the movie that you've always wondered about. I'm probably the best guy to ask. So if, you, if any of you have a question, raise your hand and I'll take one or two questions. Right down here, the young fella. Just stand up, big loud voice. Stand up, son, on your feet. I, I, could you repeat the question? I couldn't hear him. Oh, the question is, am I in the movie too? Well, actually, they gave me a cameo appearance. If you watch it again, I am the referee in the final match. Many people thought it was an Academy performance. I mean, when I blew, <laughs> and the crowd goes wild. When I blew that whistle, I was in character, all right? Maybe one more question if somebody has one. Anybody? Just shout it out, big loud voice. All right, we don't got all day, son. I couldn't hear him. The question, did I get any royalty funds? I wish I did, interestingly enough, when the studio, the studio had been in New Zealand for six months doing a film. You know, a lot of films are shot down under. Uh, Lord of the Rings was all filmed in New Zealand. And they fell in love with rugby, the second most popular sport in the world. It's soccer by a mile, then rugby, then basketball worldwide. Now, rugby is still a developing sport here in the United States, although it's the fastest growing sport. I don't believe you have a rugby club here at Bonneville, but in the state of Utah, we have some 35, 36 high schools playing rugby. And what doesn't come through in the movie is how big our team was. Uh, we had over 200 players every year. Uh, we brought in a, the 7th and 8th graders, the junior high schools. In fact, my last year coaching, we had 238 uh, young men playing rugby, 15 coaches, five different age grade teams. It was a big operation. In answer to your question, uh, when the studio came to me completely out of the blue, they got to thinking, you know, we have basketball, wrestling, ice hockey, baseball, soccer movies, but no one had ever made a movie about the second most popular sport in the world. They decided to be the first, and since that, others have came out. Did you see Matt Damon in the movie Invictus? Another rugby film. There you go. But when they came uh, and approached me, uh, they said, you got to understand right up front that um, there's no payout, there's no royalties. And you're an unknown, and they are investing millions of dollars in this production. And the movie has won several awards. And you know, I agreed to that for two reasons. Number one is it's a story that needs to be told. I mean, all false modesty aside, 418 wins and just 10 losses in 36 years. And the crowd goes wild again. And 20 national championships. There's some five or 6,000 high schools playing rugby now in the U.S. And we have a playoff like March Madness. Now, the second reason I agreed to it was that I don't know how long the good Lord's going to let me stay here on earth, but I... I mean, I'll have grandchildren, great-grandchildren, great-great-grandchildren who in this life will never know me. But, you know, they're going to have a movie, and they're going to watch that long after I'm gone and say, you know, that was my grandpa. That's what he stood for. 
And so that's why I did it. Uh, the other question that's often asked is, are the stories true? Yes, the stories and the characters are all true. Sure, there's some Hollywoodization to it, but that's one thing I insisted upon. The young man who comes to us, the, the opposing coach, playing his team in the national championship, a bounty out on his head, you, the young man who dies, the tooth and head, all of those true stories. But the one that I'm asked the most about, do you remember the kid who didn't bathe? True story. <laughs> That's right. Anyway, uh, it's, hey, it's, it's wonderful to be here today. I've been asked to talk about how do you become always a winner? And, um, you know, we're going to, there's a couple of principles. Now, here's, here's one thing I've learned. I have seen a lot of really good players and really good teams in my 36 years of coaching. I've only seen a handful of great players and only a handful of great teams. And so I started looking at what is the difference between good and great. I picked up a couple of things. One is a laser-like focus on one's objective or goal. In other words, you don't, you don't get knocked off your game. You have an ability to focus. And that's one thing we'll watch in this assembly. Do you have an ability to focus for another 25 minutes or are you constantly distracted? That is one of the signs of greatness. Another sign of moving from good to great is when we understand what greatness is. Greatness is not a comparative virtue. It has nothing to do with you and me. Greatness is when we are functioning at our best and expanding in the process. And if that progress is just little baby steps, you know that's great. The good Lord delights in baby steps. And that is the sign. Now, I'm going to tell you the biggest obstacle for you to move from good, and you are good. You really are good. But how do you move from good to great? There are some championship principles, and the biggest obstacle of moving from good to great is being good. You see, when you're good, when the team is winning, when life is going on, when maybe the company is profitable and, and things are just great, we don't always feel the positive, not diminishing pressure to push ourselves to absolutely do our best because we don't have to. Reminds me of a game that we had. Now, rugby scores, did you know that football is a break-off sport from rugby? You know, in football, you got the ball, you're running down the field, you cross the goal line, and you score a touchdown. You break that imaginary plane. Well, football was a break-off sport from rugby. In rugby, it's a tackle sport. You're running down the ball, you cross the goal line, you go into the end zone, but you haven't scored yet. See, in rugby, to score, you have to ground the ball or touch it down. That's where the word touchdown came from. And then you kick the conversion through the goalposts. Oh, why does football have goalposts? Because rugby has goalposts. So if we hear that, uh, say, Utah beats Stanford 27-10, and we didn't see the game, we have kind of an idea how the game went, don't we? Well, rugby scores the same. So we're playing Skyline, one of our arch, arch rivals. And on the field, we just don't like these guys, okay? Now, off the field, we're fine. It's kind of like you and Ogden High or, or Roy previously. You know, it's like on the field, there's such an intense rivalry. We beat these guys 47 to 6. I mean, we beat the snot bubbles out of them, okay? And we're in the locker room afterwards, and the, and the fellas, they're all pumped up and they're cheering and everything. And I said, well, fellas, hey, congratulations on a great team win. Congratulations on a league win. How do you think we did? And they uh, said, well, geez, we killed them, coach. I said, yeah, we really did. But that wasn't my question. My question is, how did we play? You see, one of the things I always taught my teams was, 
It's not about the other team. It's not about Skyline. It's not about Ogden High. It's about us. And I said, so how did we play? Did we do our best from start to finish? Or we put the game on cruise control. They thought quickly and said, well, yeah. It was, you know, 38 to 3 at halftime. And game was out of reach. And we knew it. And Yeah, we cruised through the second half. I said, yeah, we did, fellas. I said, let me tell you something. I don't want to take anything away from this win, but I can't begin to tell you how disappointed I am in this team because we didn't do our best. It's not about running up the score. It's not about embarrassing anyone, but it is about us. It's about us always in every situation, even when we don't have to. Always striving to do our best. And that is what a champion is. Now, once we have good people, and you know, my team never started out as a bunch of Heisman Trophy winners. But there was a commitment to always do our best, using other people only as a frame of reference, but not as a standard to compare our worth to them. Now, after that, there are five championship strategies. I'm just going to flat out tell you in your life and career after high school, I assume many of you will be going on to college, maybe the military work, some of you uh, serving as missionaries. I mean, you're going to be going in life. These five championship strategies will flat out guarantee your success, will guarantee that with a laser-like focus, you will move from good to great. We don't have time for all five. I'm going to talk to you about a couple of them. 